I suppose, I mean, I, I wasn't sure who was going to be here today, what kind of people. I see there are a lot of publishers around. I, I have a, a tendency to upset other publishers sometimes. So <laughs> uh, forgive me. But um, it'll be interesting. So I mean, we, Ubiquity Press is a, is a relatively new company. Um, uh, and what we do aim to do is be very disruptive. Um, we come from, all, all the people who set up the company come from a, a wide range of publishing backgrounds. Um, and we got involved here because we felt that publishing really needed to be disrupted. Um, we didn't feel that a lot of the large uh, legacy publishers were really acting in the interests of researchers, um, and that in the developed world. Um, so we also have quite a strong belief that um, disruption of publishing can be very good for the developing world as well. And that's what I'll talk about. Um, so just a very quick um, overview. I'll, I'll talk about us, because I don't think many people here know us. Um, and one of the things we do is we're very focused on university presses and developing those. Um, I'll describe our network. I seem to have changed fonts all of a sudden, so things look a bit funny. Um, and um, extending this network into the developing world, so, and some ideas we have for how that could be done in a sustainable way, how we could actually bring a lot of the disruption that's happening um, today in, in Europe and the US and so forth into other countries. So a very quick intro to us. Um, our, our mission really, as we've been set up, is to return control of publishing to universities and researchers. So to, to try and get journal and book publishing um, being run by academics in these institutions and no longer necessarily so much by large uh, publishers who we don't always feel have the same um, closeness to the research process and to the motivations of, of researchers. So what we want to do is have university presses becoming predominant again throughout the world and really competing with and out-competing large legacy publishers. So that's our vision. Um, and so we, we actually spun out of University College London um, a couple of years ago. Um, we're researcher-led. We're all active researchers. Um, I'm a, an archaeologist and I do a lot of my work in India. Um, but behind that we have about 50 years of publishing experience. Um, a lot of people from Biomed Central, PLOS, Elsevier, uh, Institute of Physics, etc. But we're, we're still relatively small. We're about 13 people based in London. Um, and we're a fully open access publisher because we, we don't believe that um, closed access is in the interest of scientific communication. We think that's a complete no-brainer. Um, we think that if you're going to follow the social contract of science and disseminate information among the, the global international um, scientific community, then the only way to do that is to be open access. So that that's, for us, is just a, there's no question. Um, and we also try to publish everything. So we, we're not just interested in books and journals. We want to publish data, uh, research software. Wetware is, is bioresources, so things like tissue samples, um, cell samples, m mosquitoes. We, we aim to give the first um, DOI to a mosquito. Um, it's not very ambitious. But, um, so that that's that side of things. So, and... The other side to us is we're very transparent. We try to be as low cost as we possibly can be. So um, we have a, a 300 um, pound article processing charge. I'm just showing this now to explain how our model works. Um, the aim is to, is to keep money within the research system and stop having people pay 10 times this amount for an article, um, which is just wasting research funding money and it's, it's, it's leaching the, the system of, of funds. Um, it's also slowing down the uptake of open access. Um, so what we do is we, we um, make it very clear exactly where all of the money goes, and we aim to build trust with researchers and funders, et cetera. But what we also have there is, is a very modular system. So if we are publishing for a university or somewhere and they want to do some of these services, then we don't charge them for it. So if they want to do their own copy editing, they want to do their own uh, layout or, or things like that, then we, we don't charge for that. So it's, the aim is to be as cost efficient uh, as possible. Um, and what we really try to do is we try to bring about this, this revolution of ours by powering university presses. And um, what we do is we, we provide a university with a, a fully rebranded platform. So basically running journal and book publication services and data publication um, using our system but fully rebranded for the university. And this is typically run from the university library. So the, um, the library is the, the typical point at which, because librarians love to talk, um, at which um, the library provides uh, 
advice to their academics on how to publish, how to gain access to book and, and journal publishing through the university press. And then we basically run the rest of the publishing services, the full stack of things from providing full editorial support through to typesetting, layout, uh, indexing, archiving, and all that sort of thing. And the only thing we charge for that is that article processing charge. Um, and then we push things into repositories. We build a big peer review network and we're building a social um, recognition layer onto that and that sort of thing. But the key thing is we try to de-risk things for the university and make things as cost efficient as possible. Um, the big issue with that really is that that's getting a lot of take up now in, in the um, developed world. So we have about six presses launching at the moment, probably another 20 or so next year. So it's, it's going to go very well, and we want to really disrupt things with this model. We want to see large journals moving back from large publishers and being published by, by universities. But it's not necessarily affordable um, for the developing world yet. I'll, I'll mention, talk about some ideas for how we can make it affordable um, going forward. Just one other side to it is that we're, we're very concerned that these university presses that we, we get established and help to run um, have a high level of research integrity. Um, we do things like we make sure there's full anti-plagiarism checking, there's very good peer review. We provide a lot of uh, guidance and training for that. We allow open peer review, all things to, to show that, that the university presses are not vanity presses, um, that because they're open access, they're, they're actually uh, of a higher um, level of integrity um, than other presses often because you can make everything open. You can make the, the peer review process open. Uh, we ensure all the members, uh, editors and members of COPE, for example, um, so there's no question of, uh, of issues so that, you know, they have contracts saying that they will follow the, the guidance and so forth. And we, we link in the university's ethics committees. So we, we try to do everything we can to make them as high profile as possible, including uploading um, research data and software with the articles. So that's just a whirlwind tour of that. But it, I think it's really critical that when these presses are set up, they're seen to be high, high quality. And this is why we think the model is actually very, very useful for the developing world, where setting up a press and getting it established and gaining international recognition might take quite a long time. And you have to do everything you can to show that you're doing things at you know, the same levels and standards um, that people in the developed world are familiar with. Um, so that's where we try to help. Um, and so what we have now is we have the idea that we, we build a network of all of these presses around the world and they support one another. Um, the idea being that they, they all together help to keep the costs down through volume, so it's a, a model of scale. Um, exchanging information, uh, best practices, we have cascading content models, so if a book is submitted to a press up here um, and it passes peer review but they decide that it doesn't fit their scope, they can pass it on to another press in the network. Um, they're all sharing a peer review network, um, which is currently only about 60,000 members but it's growing pretty quickly. Um, and they all put somebody on our steering committee. So each of these universities has a right to tell us how to run the company and how not to run the company. So we couldn't be purchased by a certain large publisher or we couldn't raise our prices or be less transparent and that, that kind of thing. So it's really about a, a partnership model. That's the key thing. And so we're working with universities like these. We are, as Ubiquity Press, we are one of the presses on the network, but we're working with, for example, Stockholm, Tromso, um, uh, Munich and so forth. So it's quite a quickly growing uh, model. And the aim of it really is that it's, it's, it's based on this sort of thing that all the presses together support one another. So um, you see the, the, the image I chose there is of birds flying in formation. Um, it's quite interesting. I was reading, a, um, strangely, I was reading a book on rugby the other day and about the, the management philosophy of the All Blacks rugby team and it ended up talking mostly about ornithology and birds. Um, and about how the birds basically become about 70% more efficient when they fly in formation. And this is very much our, our um, vision for the, the press network, that all by, by working together we keep cost, of, cost efficiency and, and so forth um, to the forefront. And it's very interesting also how when uh, a particular bird um, falls out of the um, formation, other birds will, will fall back and help it to um, keep up with the rest of the, the flock. So the, and the, the thing they say in that book is no, no bird left behind. So we sort of think of it as no press left behind. We want to see a, a network of university presses that are supporting one another and helping the, those that don't have that many resources and so forth to, to keep up and to develop um, and so forth. So for the um, developing world, what we'd like to see is 
um, a system whereby the, the, the presses that are well funded in the developed world can help um, other presses get involved by um, subsidizing them and um, help them over time to become sustainable by themselves to be able to run independently. Um, so what we assume initially is that a, a press running um, in a developing country would have 100% waivers, that all of its costs would be uh, covered by the presses in the, um, the rest of the network. Um, so, for example, a, a simple press with, say, five journals and ten books a year or something like that, you know, relatively small but getting started, probably costs about £60,000 a year to operate, according to our, our model. So what we'd like to see then is um, a network of 20 presses, for example, being able to contribute £3,000 a year each towards running that additional press. Um, another model could be something along the lines of subsidising it with £5 an article or £50 a book. Um, through the, the typical output of the network. But this is just one way we can envisage that the whole network could support um, members that need a little bit of subsidizing um, to get them started. And then as they start to develop and they start to bring in more international authors who have funding for their articles and so forth, they become more independent over time. So, so that's the model we're, we're proposing. Um, as the, the network grows next year, we would actually like to do this. Um, we would like to look at at least a couple of university presses in, in the developing world and try and bring them on board as well. So if, if anyone would like to be involved or put us in contact with someone who, who might be interested, then we'd really appreciate that. Thank you.